Well, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the Godcast. I'm delighted to say that joining me today is one of the world's greatest drummers, Vinny Carlita. It's wonderful, Vinny, to get you on the Godcast. You're over in LA. How are you over there? Thanks, Father. Lovely to meet you, and thanks for having me on the show. We're doing okay over here. Actually, today I'm I'm kind of happy because we have a, a slightly overcast day, which I've been sort of looking forward to for a long time because we've been having a heat wave and we might even be getting some rain which we could use as well yeah and have yeah. you have you managed to avoid the the pandemic is it is it is it hit your town hard or <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i mean actually i mean to be fair i think that the pandemic has hit everywhere as we as we all know but but i think that that for some reason um We've managed. We we somehow seem to have it under some kind of control here. I'm not sure. Although you know, the the thing is, is that the news constantly tells you different things daily, and I check it all the time about emerging cases. And you know, you have to sort of think about emerging cases um, of just positive tests versus yes. hospitalizations versus deaths, and and weigh in all those variables and the variants and the vaccinated and the unvaccinated and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, but, but basically, you know, thank God we've, we've been, we've been okay. Mm. Um, Vinny, yeah, I was, I was wondering where we should start. And um, I was looking at your incredible uh, catalog of work and um, I was wondering about Brits and you've worked with quite a lot of Brits. And I was wondering if there's mm -hmm. a, a big difference between the British contingent of musicians and the Americans is, is, is there a difference? Well, I mean, I think so, but, but I also think that, that, um, I mean, I th I'm not sure if that's shifted over the years or not. Um, but, but my, my whole experience was that, you know, uh, let's just say spanning from the last 30 years or so, um, <clears throat> was was that that it seemed as though that 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 what was coming out of britain was much more concerned with conceptual and sonic sort of you know qualitative things and explorations etc cetera, etc cetera, which is you know partially why i mixed my my own one solo record that i did in england because i love the, the sound that came out of there and to be fair as well you know some of my earliest influences were a combination of, of let's say, Britpop and the and the British invasion, so to speak, in mm. the early '60s, and Motown and R and B and soul music coming from America. So there was a mixture there. But but you know, it was it's often been said that yeah, well, the American musicians focus on technique, and whereas you know, European musicians focus on on aesthetic or whatever that may be. And I mean, I think that that wouldn't have come about that saying wouldn't have come about if there were not a grain of truth in that so uh, you know but i think that that just to sort of classify that hard, hard and fast and just say you know that's that's a hard and fast delineation is not fair because everybody has technique now and yada 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 so i just and and also you know just just with the sort of globalization of just in of the immediacy of of audio visual um you know, communication has, has made it so that there's actually been, you know, dare I say some homogeneity that's occurred mm. uh, from everybody watching the same thing. And, and therefore, Oh, I'm going to play this too. We can do this too. We can do this in Timbuktu and we can do this in Akron, Ohio and look at me, I'm playing the same stuff and I have all these chops and you know what I mean? It's just, there's that now. Mm. So, so I don't know whether, whether or not, you know, I think that, that with all the pluses that you know the immediacy of 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 what the internet offers us uh, has that that there's also a threat of 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 creating this homogeneity as well as as externalizing ourselves that uh in, in into externalizing our self-worth in into um you know the world following us and the amount of attention that we get from complete strangers you know mm -hmm. which was really one of the hallmarks of i think of celebrity dumb but but i don't want to get ahead of myself because i harp on that kind of stuff all the time so you know yeah <laughs> Vinny, i'm i'm very much an 80s kid so uh, respectfully you're a few years older than i am but but <laughs> i very much enjoy the mu music of the 80s and 
and, and yeah. fans of yours might be interested to know that you work with people like uh, Nick Kershaw and oh. uh, Paul Young and, yes. and, and Five Star, who were a bit of a, a force to be reckoned with in the 80s. Can you share a few recollections of those times? Yeah, I, I don't know how much I could share with you recollection about Five Star, but, but I actually, what happened was when I started working with Sting, you know, it, I had already at that point had a, a, um, a well-established studio career that, that took a few years to develop, but, but it was there. And so um, I thought, well, you know, uh, this could damage my studio career going on the road all the time. Right. But, but it didn't. Um, and, and how, the, the way that I found that, how I found out about that was that <laughs> after uh, a few times of doing lengthy tours and then having some time in between, I'd come off the road and I immediately kind of went right back into sessions. Not only that, but then I suddenly became international man. So, you know, I found myself going back and forth a lot to England mm. to do sessions. And so I was, I would be working, I was working with Hugh Padgham at that time and we would do these sessions and, and I'd go over and I, I, I would go to London and do these records like with Julia Fordham and, and people like that. And, or sometimes it would be just in, in breaks, on a tour or if we were parked in London and people would find out I was there and I, I worked with the, the, and, uh, um, and Duran Duran and, and, um, and, and it was fun. It was really a lot of fun doing those things. It was exciting. And, um, and, and, and I worked with Nick because I had become aware of Nick Kershaw, um, from some friends of mine in LA that had worked with him, uh, that knew of him. And so, so I found out about him and, and, and he discovered his music and then I went to go see him live and I got to meet him. And I think uh, the, the, the concert that I saw him, I think our friend Pino Palladino was on that concert. So I got to meet Nick and I became a huge fan. And then my friend Peter Wolf that I had worked with in Frank Zappa's band um, produced him. And so they called me to do it. And we, we, we recorded this record here in L.A., called The Works um, at a studio in Tarzana, California called, that at that time was called Can-Am. Um, we used to lovingly refer to it as the bowling alley because one of the studios was really long and narrow, but but that's where that was done. And, and I thought, you know, and I still think to this day, of course, that I thought, you know, this guy is such a brilliant musician and he, he he stayed he, he 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 stood his own ground and, and with his beliefs and where he wanted to go musically because obviously with a guy like Nick you know he was a young guy young good looking guy who obviously record companies want to make it to this boy idol which was happening right but Nick thought you know what the, my musical statement is more important than anything and and he you know the, these kind of musicians these kind of folks to me are the real heroes mm. the real heroes who because if that if 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 his backers his financial backers and marketers had allowed that to happen without you know because there's always this pushback and and then i i would i would i would dare to say that that actually continues to push the quality of music that makes it into the pop mean, mainstream yeah yeah and, and, and keep it at a specific level mm. you know what i'm saying because yeah. i mean you're talking about somebody who's such a brilliant musician that the way that this guy conceives of his stuff his songs and what he can remember and how he hears it in his head i mean this is like genius level stuff and so you know then you have to also consider <clears throat> that at that time i mean you have to ask yourself well why would they allow that to happen? Because we had Steely Dan on the radio at that time. And so, you know, a, a, a good friend of mine who has a very successful YouTuber now, uh, Rick Beato, he just did a, a video recently. And I think the title of it was Low Information Music. <laughs> so so it's like, really, when you think about it, it's you, you have to think about a lot of what's going on now that, that is supposed to be have been done in the name of progress and you know oh yeah. this is all you know we, we, we've we've got this new stuff now and it's just low information music you know whereas before 
you know, wow, melody and harmony actually existed and there was a degree of rhythmic sophistication that was allowed and mm -hmm. and you kind of had to play in real time very accurately, but be able to interact with people whilst doing it. And that and as you're documenting something forever. So the sensibilities were a little bit different, you know? Yeah. So so that's kind of my long and tangential take on it all. So you, you have to excuse me because of the way my mind works, Absolutely. you know, it kind of it kind of spiders out into a lot of different directions. You know? I like I like hearing that kind of well, you know, that deepness to, to the richness of what makes up a great musician and stuff. But you know, I wanted to ask you about um, yourself as a as a kid. I'm sure lots of people have asked you about your musical influences, but but um, were you, were you uh, of a family that where church was involved in your upbringing you know and so i suppose where i'm going with this is you know yep. were you influenced by hymns and things like that was that part of your life well it was and it wasn't meaning that i i was brought up as a catholic but i wasn't a good catholic because not because i'm saying because because i was some sort of abject sinner that you know completely went against the grain of what the church was teaching but because <laughs> i didn't understand it i just kind yeah. of went along with what the ritualistic things were so consequently as a result of that um you know and and so so it wasn't really influenced by the hymns but but as a result of that <clears throat> i sort of went on this spiritual search for years after that and and i officially came to christ in a sense um yeah, I guess you could say that, you know, when you pray the sinner's prayer, like I'm, I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it, uh, in 1997. So uh, the thing is, though, is that what's interesting for me is that as I was doing all this searching and exploring all these philosophical and various spiritual avenues, I don't think that I ever went away from Christ because I remember once we were on a tour bus and this was, you know, at one of the lowest points of my sort of depravity. And, you know, one of the people in the touring party said something about Jesus, that he was defeated, but he didn't put it in those words. And I remember just randomly and for no particular reason at all, swiveling around and just kind of pulling out both swords and saying, no, he didn't. You know, I said that didn't happen to him, you know, and and like I was like ready, like okay, let's go. Not not physical blows, but you want to go toe to toe with me on that. And he backed off, and I thought to myself, and I looked back at that <clears throat> years later, and I went, "Wow, here I was, a very quote unsaved person, mm -hmm. immediately running to Jesus' defense, you know, as though like." how dare you say that about my savior? Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I found that to be very interesting, but so, so the church, so in that sense, you know, I mean, and, and, and then later, you know, in terms of like sort of Christian hymns, those things really didn't have that much of an influence on me musically either. No. And, and neither, neither did, did so-called Christian music because although I ended up doing working with Christian artists and playing on Christian records and doing some concerts and this and the other thing. Um, but what I mean to say is that um, what affected me most uh, was, was I think, you know, and I'm not sure I, I'm not going to say chicken or egg here, but, but sort of being touched by the Holy spirit and the word, mm. the actual, actual scripture itself um, just sort of, I think took hold in my heart and and that impacted me more than any of the music coming out of the church. However, uh, you know, there's some church music that I absolutely love. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I was talking to a Christian musician on the Godcast not long ago and, and he was talking about the Psalms and um, you know, and how, how they'd kind of influenced him in kind of, uh, if, if you ever, have you ever played to any uh, kind of anything like the Psalms? Vinny or not? No, but you know what? I did a, a song with Joni Mitchell years ago where she based the lyric on Corinthians. Right, okay. About, about love. So that that was really interesting. And it was a beautiful, a beautiful track. And uh but that's about as close as I've gotten. So yeah. I think it's interesting, Vinny, listening to you because uh, I don't know if this is a typical American thing, but 
something I, I, I've noticed, I've only been to America once, but I was there talking to somebody about faith. The Americans seem to be very confident in their faith is where the Brits seem to be quite typically, typically British, actually, you know, stiff upper lip and all that kind of thing. Is that something you've noticed? Uh, you know, the, the circles that you frequent, uh, do people talk about these matters openly or not? Um, you mean spiritual matters? Yeah. Well, I, I, no. no. I mean, I think I think oftentimes, sometimes I would notice <clears throat> them sort of randomly coming up in conversation, or else I may have had to have instigated it. Um, but but not really. And I and I, it's interesting because that you would say that because I, you know I see a lot of I, when I spent the, the time that I spent. Uh, there, it, it, I just saw a lot of other kind of influences and, you know, that, that people were adhering to spiritually, but at the same time, there was a sort of built in respect for the church, but almost as though they had to have it because it was just part of the culture. And yeah. to me, that's kind of like, well, no, you mean, okay, that's great because you, culture is to be respected, but, but yeah, no, you, you, mm. you got to have deeper reasons, you know? Vinny, have you have you ever lived in the UK? Well, I haven't lived lived there, but I would spend months and months on end. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, you know, I mean, yeah, months at a time. So, I guess in a way, you could say I'd, I'd live there, and I would do that on and off over a period of years. So, I spent a lot of time there, where I would be there for months at a time. So, yeah, and would you? Would and, you? And, and, I, and I love it. Yeah, where would I you hang out? Absolutely love it. Well, <clears throat> London. Um, Near, uh, uh, close to sort of Stonehenge, that area. Um, yeah, basically those two places, yeah. like around uh, between London and Wiltshire. So, okay. but but I have to say that I'm I'm kind of an Anglophile. I absolutely love England. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love it. Uh, it's I absolutely love it. And um, <clears throat> if people if people said to me, well, "Could you see yourself living there?" I'd be like, "Absolutely." Well, what's stopping you? <laughs> You know what? A lot of things, really, and I'm not sure if they're valid reasons, but okay. I'll leave that alone because we have limited time. Okay, um, Vinny, I want to. Uh, I've only got you for a while. A few of my favorite artists you've worked with. Um, can you share a few of your memories with Len about Leonard Cohen, who is who is an artist who you've worked with and who I just love his. I love his his skill and his articulation and his words. Just tell us yeah. a bit about Leonard. Well, I mean, I think. <clears throat> A lot of times when you're working and you're, you're rubbing shoulders with these people, a lot of times people think that you have, you may be able to offer insights, very valuable insights that, that could not otherwise have been given. But in my case, working with Leonard was just, you know, it was very easy. He was very easy going, very easy going. And um, he, and, and I just witnessed his brilliance just from hearing him and sort of absorbing what he said, just like the the listener did in the end, just like the end listener did. The only difference is I was playing the drums. That's it. But, mm. but he was very easy going and there was no sort of back and forth about what I should do to honor this part of a lyric. It, none of that, none of that. It was just like, my thing was strictly an accompaniment and it was, it was treated as such, you know, because sometimes you do recordings and if you do them in a pop context, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's almost, I mean, dare I say the word static accompaniment, but, but yeah. at the same time, back then when we were cutting songs, there would be some developmental things that happened as well. You know, you play the first verse one way and, and it's not going to sound the same as the second verse, because by the time you got to the second verse after the chorus, you know, Johnny stole the car now and he's chasing after his girlfriend. You know what I mean? Something else happened. Yeah. You know, yeah. Vinny, do, do, you, do you prefer playing the melancholy or do you, or, or not? Or do you prefer the kind of, you know, rip roaring stuff or, or is it, is it all part of being a musician? I think it's all part of being a musician. I don't, I don't categorize what I prefer in terms of melancholy versus rip roaring. I think if the melancholy has a certain kind of depth it causes me to, to reach deep, deep inside of myself. And I, I can resonate with that when I play it and it causes that reaction in me. And in terms of rip roaring, it, it's, it, that's all contextual to me. 
like sometimes if people want me to do that just for the sake of doing it, but I can't find really any content in it, then I can't really, I seem to force myself to want to do that just for the yeah. sake of, you know, just really letting it rip. You know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. it, it has to be yeah. contextual for me. There has to be a contextual reason in my head, in my mind. And, and you've worked extensively with Sting. How did you meet Sting? How did that come about? It came about, um, it was an interesting thing. Uh, at that time, a good friend of mine, Robin Ford, said that his wife was was working with Sting on something, of um, some Broadway thing, and, and that he was, he thought that he had heard something that he wanted a band, or he thought I might be good for that, and somehow word got to Sting's manager at that time. So they called me up and said, yeah, we've heard about you. Um, and so we would like you to come to England to have a play and see how it feels. And, and then they, they wanted me. And, and, and so I think what happened was they were saying, just fly over. And I said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll, you fly me there. And, and if I, if I don't get chosen, I'll pay for my ticket. If I do, then, you know, the bill's on you. <laughs> so, so I went there and, and they chose me and that was the end of that. But but the thing is, is that he, he was one of the people that I, that I felt that I resonated with musically. And interestingly enough, and by the grace of God and, and, and the kind of thing that he put in me to sort of understand certain things and, and believe, you know, uh, it, it actually came to pass where I ended up playing with a lot of my heroes and people that I resonated with. Like I felt like I could really, there was an old hippie term back in the sixties and the seventies called grok, G R O K. Like I grok this and it came to mean total understanding. So I, I think that that would encompass a, a visceral kind of understanding as well as an intellectual one. But I really felt like I grokked these people <laughs> musically, you know, it's like yeah. I kind of, I really got them. And, and, you know, all of these people were coming at me at the same time, all those kind of musical influences. And so, yeah, you know, I mean, Sting and Peter Gabriel, I loved all these people, Frank Zappa, you know, John McLaughlin, Mahavishnu Orchestra and, and Herbie Hancock. And, and here, I, and all I, my whole thing was, you know, I just want to play with my heroes and I want to play music like that. And I yeah. want to do that. And, and that, and you know, that was sort of my, my focus. And there you go. Did, uh, Sting seems a kind of a, a deeply spiritual philosophical kind of gentleman. Did, did, did you, did he have an influence upon you? You talked about your, your journey. Is, is he a man that's uh, left a mark on you? Oh yeah. When you spend that much time with someone, absolutely. And he's a, uh, He's a deep thinker, and obviously a very, very bright guy, an intellectual, and um, you know, and a, and a, a great wordsmith, songsmith, um, and and so we 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 get into these conversations, you know, about various philosophical types of things, and yeah, sociological things and spiritual mm -hmm. things, and 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 you know, I think that it was more like we sort of bounced things off of each other. Um, but at the same time, I was, I was sort of, I became firmly rooted in my Christendom. Um, and, and, and it, I wasn't swayed away by any, any other influences. And this is an interesting thing because I think that what happens is, is that if people sort of get to a point where they come to Christ, it, it can happen in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. It's like sometimes you could feel a person could feel so spiritually lost that they bottom out and they come to Christ. And so then as a new Christian, you're seeking spiritual food and, and it could be argued that you're in a very vulnerable state, mm. meaning that you need to sort of be around people who are going to feed you that right and proper food versus taking you in a million different directions of possible outcomes with different kinds of spiritual paths because all that does is mire people in confusion and so i think that and 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 it also means that it's there's a responsibility upon those who are pastoring and mentoring and fostering new christians that they have to take care because 
that's that's at the core of people's being you know that's your spiritual that's at the middle of your heart and and you have to take great care mm. of 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 there's a great responsibility i think that mm. pastors and priests they have so you know uh, then and only then after i this is my opinion and and my opinion based on personal experience so in a sense i guess you could say it's anecdotal but but it's also evidential um that 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 as as you become more firmly rooted um, then you could start being able to start looking and sort of poking at ecumenical things mm. without losing your footing. Yeah. If that makes any sense. It, it does. I, I think it's, to be honest, Vinny, I think it's in, incredibly wise because when, when somebody new rocks up at our church, uh, you know, the, the kind of the elders, the kind of, oh, they're full of excitement and they want to grab them and they want them to, give them volunteering roles and this, that, and the other. But I think what you've just said is, is so important that it's, it's a gentleness, isn't it? It's an, an invitation and it's a, it's mm. a process and it's a journey. And, and uh, do you know, Vinny, the time has absolutely flown by. I, I feel like I've barely scratched the surface. So a couple of things I just want to ask. One is about um, music uh, and, and obviously your skill as a drummer. What is it? My favorite band is Depeche Mode, Vinny. I've loved them since a kid. I've always loved them they have the ability and other musicians and songs have the ability to take me to a spiritual level. And I was wondering what you, what you think it is about music that, that does that. I mean, if I, I can, it's our heavenly you. language. Yeah, I think it is. And I think that it's, it, it's, it, it has that power. It just does. And, and because it was given to us by God, it's our heavenly language. And it has, it has that kind of mystical power you know, once I spoke to a dear friend of mine who will remain la nameless out of respect, who was a very committed Christian, yeah. who actually said that the fallen one, and I won't even speak his name, uh, was actually adorned with his body was an, like a musical instrument and that he was the commander of, of the choir. And you know what I mean? Of the musicians. And yeah. so that was a very, very sad thing. And so we have to be careful because I think that music because you know we're dealing with the the ruler of this world you know and the prince of the power it's kind of like we have to be careful because we have to notice that music has been usurped right now and and i think we need to look at it through spiritual eyes because it has so much power we have res great responsibilities musicians and when you couple the words with rhythmic and melodic sort of vehicular modes of delivery yeah. with the entire musical package you're really getting into people's psyche so deep that you have a great responsibility great responsibility to not sort of deliver any kind of botulism to them or toxic poison which is exactly what's happening with most things today because I mean, you, you can see it even with Alzheimer's patients. They sort of like, they can't even remember their name. They look at you and they don't know who you are. But if you start singing their favorite song, they chime in with the melody and the lyric. It's an interesting phenomenon. Yeah, so that tells you how deep it penetrates into the human brain. So it's a powerful thing. It's our heavenly language. And we need to be very, very responsible with it. Yeah, it's it's so profound. that My, my dad had dementia. And, the, and he was a pianist. And the last thing that went was his ability to play the piano. And, and I'll never forget him playing a nightingale sang in Barclay Square. It was the last piece of music he played, but it was uh, beautiful as wow. well. Wow. Really beautiful. So, yes. Vinny, I've got one, one last question, if that's yes. all right. Um, have, you, have you reached all the corners of the drum kit or are you still, are you still on a journey of discovery with that instrument or? Well, I'm, I'm in an interesting place now at my age where I think that, you know, let's put it this way. The short answer is no. And, and I don't think it, it ever happens. I think that the whole thing is process. Life, we're constantly in process. So that's the short answer, no. But, but a slightly longer answer is that I think that I've gotten to a point where I'm at a comfort zone, but I'm not afraid to stretch it. However, I don't see that as being a bad thing. You get to a point where you just go, look, this is who I am. This is how I do what I do. And in a way, 
it kind of cements your identity and and that's not a bad thing so that's yes. the slightly longer answer this could go on for a while too but we'll leave it there <laughs> i'll go i'll go one last question because you just sure. made me think so so when you're when you're with an artist Who's influencing who there? Are you, are you, are you the man in control there or, or is that? Um, it's yes and no. I, it's, it's kind of like, it really depends on the dynamic of each situation. There's yeah. a theoretical dynamic and an actual one. Theoretically, you would think that if you're in a position where let's say like, like in a typical classical old school environment of, of musicians recording in a room together live, so the producer ideally is a great casting agent as well as being able to have the overview of what the artist is about and and or wants you know and so so in that sense he casts his cast and then the cast obeys direction but also in a particular context the producer might want input to shape these songs and that happened a lot in the 60s even before, way before i was on the scene people like the wrecking crew you would hear like they would come up with hooks for songs that didn't even exist you know or things that became very recognizable so you know the amount of input and directive actually changes and it's a it's a sort of give and take that you have to be aware of all the time mm. you might be in a situation where it's kind of static and it you might feel it appropriate to say, oh, I have an idea that might it that might, you know, be valid and 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 speed it along so that you, you can kind of get to the result. Mm -hmm. So you know what I'm saying? It's it's a contextual yeah. dynamic. Yeah. Fascinating stuff, Vinny. Yeah. Well Vinny, that 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 35 minutes is absolutely flown by. I really <laughs> love chatting to you. I, I'm I'm such a fan of music and uh, I admire artists like yourself with such a, a wonderful skill and and thank you so much for coming on the Godcast. Um, hopefully, are you, are, have you any plans to be in the UK anytime soon, Vin? It's, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Um, uh, no, I don't. I was actually supposed to be there in May of this year, which has flown by, but but it was postponed. Um, so we're, you know, obviously because of the pandemic, um, but I was, uh, the plan was to be there with Jeff Beck to play the Albert Hall. Um, and so that has now, you know, yeah, it's all this is everything is in flux right now. So, um, but what I can say is that if if we do return to any kind of sense of normalcy, um, whereby you know there's uh travel that's people are able to travel without any sort of bizarre draconian things, uh, then it won't be soon enough. So, yeah, wonderful, yeah. okay, Vinny. Well, thank you so much. We send our love and prayers from the UK. It's Thank you. Pouring down with rain here in Lancashire. You probably <laughs> glorious sunshine there, but uh, no, we're 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 looking like we have clouds in the sky. It's about to rain here as well. So thanks for having me, and um, God bless you. God bless you. Thanks, Vinny.